Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Go Geo. As usual, I'm your field guide, Heather, and today it's time for another adventure in the field. We are in California today, surrounded by beautiful scenery, as you can probably see. We have some nice granite outcroppings all around us, lots of dusty material on the ground here from eroding pumice with pieces of obsidian, because not far from us, are the mono craters and the long valley caldera region lots of igneous material all around i have spectacular views of sierra nevadas and if you've already noticed a beautiful blue lake down there and that's what we'll be talking about today that is mono lake mono lake is a rather large lake sitting in the mono basin but one thing to note is that it's not as big as it used to be and this is due to both geologic historical reasons as well as human caused factors. You see, in 1941, Los Angeles DWP began diverting water from the tributary streams that fed Mono Lake. This, of course, had pretty drastic consequences on the lake. Over the next 40 years, it caused it to drop by 45 vertical feet. It lost half of its volume. It doubled in salinity. And these factors obviously had bad consequences on the surrounding ecological systems. It was terrible for migratory and nesting birds, including the California gull, which suffered immensely from these changes. Air quality was greatly diminished. It led to toxic dust storms in the area. All of this changed the lake forever. As a result of all of this, advocacy groups sprang up, they spoke up, and they ended up setting a management required level at which to keep the lake, and that level was 6,392 feet. As you can see, this is very different from the historical levels. Take a look at this graph. You can see the historical level before diversions and that decreasing of the lake volume over time. This shows where the lake level would have been, likely, had it not been diverted. And this shows where the lake has been, including what you can see is it's failed to really meet that desired management level. They've had some issues reaching that water level, and this is why. The lake level is dependent on about four primary factors, two of which have to do with water input into the lake. The first one is the Sierra Nevada snowfall. The winter snowfall and the spring melt greatly influences this lake level. And it's probably about three quarters of the influence of the lake level. Unfortunately, snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas has been quite low. So it's basically been in drought condition. Even though that factor looks small, like maybe a couple percent difference, because it's such a big influence on the lake level, that has led to the lake level staying quite low and making it difficult, again, to reach that desired level, keeping in mind that that level is still significantly lower than where it would be had that not been diverted. The other factor that goes in to the lake level is the Great Basin precipitation levels. And those precipitation levels have also been low. This area is and has been in a drought for some time. That factor is probably about the other 25% of the inflow into the lake. So combined, those are the main inflow factors keeping the lake level low. Now let's talk about the other factors that influence the lake level. As you can see on this side, you can actually see those bathtub rings, the things that show us where the lake level once was. The lake level is also obviously much lower because of something we've already talked about, and that's those diversions. And the other outflow factor that matters is evaporation. Now because of these abnormally low lake levels, one interesting thing has shown up, and that is these peculiar tower-like structures around the lake, sometimes close to the shoreline and some are a little further away. They're interesting looking, almost works of art in these strange structural shapes. And people actually come from all over to look at those. And what we're talking about is tufa. Because of the lower lake levels, the tufa has been exposed around the lake. And unfortunately, this means it's actually now threatened because of erosional forces and the fact that it's no longer growing. Let's actually go down for a closer look at the tufa around the lake. We've made it. 
And if you see those strange structures along the lakeshore back there, well, that's it. That's tufa. And you might be thinking, it kind of looks like tuff or pumice, but tufa is actually very different than tuff. Tuff, not to be confused with tufa and pumice, are silica-based extrusive volcanic rocks. You might also be thinking, it looks kind of like a coral reef. And we're getting a bit closer with that. Tufa, similar to marine carbonates like limestone, are made up of calcium carbonate. However, tufa and its counterpart travertine primarily form in terrestrial freshwater environments, with one interesting exception, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's go down and take a closer look. Tufa is made up primarily of the minerals calcite and aragonite, which are two of the three polymorphs of calcium carbonate minerals. It's probably also made up of galusite, which is a hydrated sodium calcium carbonate mineral. But why does it all form here? Well, it all starts elsewhere with a little rain, rainwater, which is weakly acidic from interactions with pollutants and atmospheric carbon dioxide, forming carbonic acid, interacts with carbonates and ends up creating calcium bicarbonate, which is more soluble. Calcium carbonate has very low solubility in pure water, but in carbon dioxide enriched rainwater, it becomes more soluble as calcium bicarbonate. Once the waters are enriched with the carbonate, then they can deposit. Sometimes as the slow drip forming stalactites or stalagmites in caves, and sometimes in a body of water, like a lake, where it becomes oversaturated and hence precipitates out into incrustations or even towers. The tufa at Mono Lake form underwater. Beneath Mono Lake, calcium-rich freshwater springs seep up from orifices on the lake bottom and mix with saline-rich and carbonate-rich lake water. Think baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate. Mono Lake contains chlorides, carbonates, and sulfates. It's an alkaline lake with a pH of 9.8 and is almost three times as salty as the Pacific Ocean. So why is it so salty and heavy with dissolved solids? Well, mainly because it is a closed lake. With the only natural way for water to leave the lake being evaporation, up to four vertical feet of water can evaporate during the course of a year. Meaning, without the inflow of freshwater streams, there would be no lake. So while it is naturally saline, it becomes even more concentrated in salts and those other minerals when it is artificially reduced. The calcium carbonate then precipitates or settles out of solution as a hard substance around the spring. And within decades to centuries, it can form a tufa tower. Tufa towers can grow to more than 30 feet under the water. The tufa forms slowly on the lake bottom into many forms from incrustations on vegetation to towers. Tufa can only grow in places where the right chemical conditions exist. Some tufas actually do grow in the ocean. We can find submarine tufa columns off the southwest coast of Greenland. The fjord consists of thousands of columns that have been shown to contain a carbonate mineral that requires near freezing conditions to remain stable. Tufa is also common at other Great Basin Desert lakes, like Pyramid Lake north of us in Nevada but Mono Lake has some of the most active formations. Some dry Great Basin lakes in California, Nevada, still have remnant tufas from the Ice Age. Even Mono Lake has its own Ice Age tufa that are now hundreds of feet above pre-diversion lake levels. Mono Lake itself used to be much larger, five times as large as it is. Though these tufa are rock formations, they can be on the fragile side. They can crumble and topple, they can also get damaged from erosion, wave action, and they can also get damaged by people. And all those water diversions have reduced lake levels such that the tufa, as you can see, are now exposed, making them vulnerable and inhibiting growth as they are above lake level now. Stream diversions can also change water chemistry, reducing that inflow of carbonate-rich water. And because of the stream diversions and the damage dealt to Mono Lake and the surrounding tufa, Mono Lake advocacy groups ask that we spread the word and use the hashtag #SaveTheTufa. Mono Lake and its tufa are also really important habitat sites for a number of species. It's important for the California gulls and migratory birds, and the tufa serve as nesting sites for owls and osprey. And these serve as underwater habitat to the alkali flies. These tufa provide exceptional substrate habitat for the flies. 
being a rough, hard surface with many crevices. And the flies actually also help build their own homes. Precipitation isn't the only way the tufa forms. Biogenesis is the biological activity of organisms like the alkali fly in this case. When an adult alkali fly emerges from the pupa case underwater, it leaves behind a tiny deposit of calcium carbonate, a waste product from its earlier life stage. So alkali flies on a small scale actually help contribute to the growth of the tufa towers. The nearby Monocrater's volcanic field consists of vents in Mono Lake and on its north shore. The most recent activity in the Long Valley to Mono Lake region took place only about 300 years ago. When lake bottom sediments forming much of Pahoa Island were uplifted by a rhyolitic intrusion, the most prominent feature of the Mono volcanic field is Black Point, which rises above the northwest shore. Mono Lake lies at the northernmost end of the Mono Inyo Crater's volcanic field. Soon we'll talk a lot more about that Mono Inyo Crater's volcanic field and the Long Valley Caldera, which we've already touched on on a little excursion. Here's one more strange fact about Mono Lake. During the Cold War era, this area was actually used for top secret seismic tests. And in the 80s, researchers accidentally discovered radioactive anomalies in the lake that they concluded might have been due to the disposal into the lake of radioactive material, such as spent nuclear medicine tracers, or possibly nuclear research reactor material, or even the Navy testing underwater nuclear bombs in the 50s. And this practice may have been suspended due to the newly built munitions depot located near Hawthorne, Nevada, at the southern portion of Walker Lake, which we'll be exploring next. Recall the reason that we can even see a lot of this tufa today is because of all those stream diversions. And this actually isn't the only water diversion catastrophe caused by LADWP. Actually, not long ago, we talked about another one. Owens Lake. So if you'd like to check out that adventure, check out my video on Owens Lake. It's starting to get a little warm down here. Let's head back up into the mountains. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's interesting look at Mono Lake. Stay tuned because we will be talking a lot more about many of the very interesting geologic features in this area. It has complex geology, interesting geology, and there's so much to look at that I can't get enough. So much more to come from the Mono Basin, from Walker Lane. We'll do Mono Craters. We'll talk about more about volcanics and igneous rocks, the Sierra Nevadas, earthquakes, volcanoes, lots of cool stuff to come here. So hope to see you guys on the next adventure here at Let's Go Geo. Mm -hmm.